How important is it for a Christian to praise God? Uh, Jesus, as he was riding uh, on the, the donkey into Jerusalem for Palm Sunday, uh, the, as the people uh, praised him, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, stood off to the side and they uh, castigated Jesus for not uh, reprimanding uh, the people for praising him. Uh, in Luke chapter 19, verse 40, Jesus answered the religious leaders and said to them, I tell you that if, if these uh, who are praising him should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. He said, if the, the people that are the crown of my creation will not worship me, the Messiah, an inanimate, lifeless object will cry forth praise to the Messiah. How important is praise? That important. You have to ask yourself, how often do you stop and praise God? It's easy to complain. There's plenty to complain about, right? No complainers here? Uh, but um, it's easy to, you know, look at the negative side of things. But, but Jesus says, when you look at life, uh, stop and pause to give praise to me. And who is Jesus? Well, according to uh, Colossians 1, 16 and 17, he's the creator who spoke the cosmos into existence. He's the glue that holds it all together. So when you're praising him, you're praising the one who made you. David understood this. Uh, David loved to write music, loved to play uh, on his harp, uh, which I said, I guess, was the, their version of a Stratocaster. If you don't know what a Stratocaster is, I cannot help you. Uh, it's like a guitar. Uh, and so David loved to write worship songs, and Psalm 33 was a worship song. And in this worship song, he gives us the reasons why you would praise God. Uh, and we've been working our way through these. And why are we spending so many uh, weeks on Psalm 33? Because praise is that important. So after today, I hope you really understand uh, what you need to be doing in your walk with God, and that's pra praising Him. So let's look at the main motif that we've covered. You should have this memorized. This is what he's talking about all through the psalm. Yeah, he says we should do what? We should praise God for two things. Number one, who he is. Are you with me? Praise God for who he is and then what he does. So uh, who, who is he? So he tells us uh, the first reason to praise God when we're reviewing here uh, is uh, verses one and two. Praise him for his person, who his person is. Uh, who is his person? Uh, he says he, he's the Lord, L-O-R-D, all capitalized. So by way of review, it's test time. When you see L-O-R-D capitalized, what name of God is that? Yahweh. Yahweh. What does that mean? It's, it's associated with the Hebrew verb to be. He's the ontologically all-existent one outside of time and space, created time and space. He's not in our dimensionality. He has no potentiality about him at all. We do. He's fully actualized. He always is the, the great God of all time. He said, praise him. That's who he is. Then praise him for uh, his practice. Verses four to five, we're still reviewing. Uh, praise him for his practice. What is his practice? Well, his practice is he gives us truth. He gives us the word of truth, meaning he built into the warp and woof of our beings the concept of moral law and spiritual law. You cannot get away from it. You always know what you ought to do, but you have a free will to choose. But he always tells you, you should do this, you should not do that. Um, it's, it's the spirit speaking to you that you know. It's that co cognition of, of understanding there's absolute truth. And even though my culture has thrown absolute truth to the wind, uh, they are absolutely wrong because it absolutely exists, doesn't it? That there is truth. And God says, this is true, that is not true. Uh, praise him for his power. Uh, we, we, we spoke about last week uh, the creation of the cosmos, uh, verses 6 to 9, how powerful is he? Meaning, if he created the cosmos uh, with a word, um, uh, then he could totally take care of my life. And I should not fear because he has awesome power. And we have a, a, a church that, we have an interesting church, do we not? I have to do like extra research on everything I say because there's going to be a NASA official here, here or something. So I go into my office today to pick up a book and there's a giant spread sheet like poster of, of the Milky Way galaxy. I didn't put it there. One of our parishioners brought it in. I don't know how they got in my office. It's got a special key. This is an unusual church. Who knows who they work for? They got in, put it in there for me to see. As I walk into the office today, they told me about it earlier and then they showed up somehow and got it in there. So and I walk in seeing the Milky Way and seeing our placement on the arm that we are. It's totally perfect and everything. How great is God, his power? But today we want to add to that. And by the way, who hasn't stopped on a hike at night and looked up at the stars? And what did you think to yourself? Oh, that's cool. Let's move on. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you stop and you praise God. This is amazing. Uh, praise him for his plans is what we want to talk about today. That was all review. 
This is a uh, new stuff. Praise him for his plans. Verses 10 to 17. So uh, in hermeneutics, Bible study methods, if you want to look at the core of a passage, you look at where the main emphasis is placed by definition of the law of proportion. So here we have verses 10 to 17 deals with the plans of God. So he's going to tell you, in addition to the things he's already talked about, he wants to really focus on the plan of God. Because if you look at your world, it does not look like God's got a plan. And if he's got a plan, it doesn't look like he's doing too well maintaining said plan. Right? I mean, our world is a messed up place, isn't it? Riots. I mean, Portland. You going to take a job there? Sad. I mean, the mayor can't even figure out how to defend the city. It's unbelievable. Riots, looting, injustices committed by rogue police officers. Yeah, they exist. But I was a chaplain for 1,300 police officers before I came here. And I was raised by a dad who was a federal agent, who was in charge of hundreds of agents. Are there bad agents and bad police officers? Yeah. They're, they're only human. Uh, there are injustices. But does that mean they're all evil? No. Because I, as the chaplain, knew a lot of great men and women who were in law enforcement. But we live in, in very terrible times, do we not? Uh, where things are, are, are always turned to the evil. Criminals running loose, being freed because of the virus. and It's insane. There's not a day goes by, I don't think, what, in the, what can happen next? But I grew up in the 60s. I was a kid in the 60s. So I watched everything switch from the 50s to the 60s. I watched all that as I drove across the, 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 from California to South Carolina every summer to see my dad's 10 sisters, no brothers, and to see my grandma's 16 brothers and sisters, to see my grandpa's 10 brothers and sisters, and all of their children. Literally, I am related to this town. My aunts and uncles wanted me to marry somebody from there. I couldn't do it, and they're always wanting to know why, and I'm like, they'd be kin. There's just no way. <laughs> But I went to South Carolina all through the 60s, all through the 70s, drove across the states every year. But I, who grew up on a border town, where most of my friends were Hispanic or black, those were my friends. I played on a baseball team, 18 guys uh, on the team, coach was a Green Beret, came back from Nam, he was black. My dad had coached him when he was a little league player. Okay, he became my coach. And there's 18 guys on the team, 16 are black, I'm the only starting white guy. Those are my friends. That's who I grow, grew up with. But when I'd go to South Carolina in 65, 66, 67, what do you think I encountered there? I didn't even understand that world. I'd go to the theater with my, with my cousins, and I had a bunch of them. We filled the theater. And I remember the first time I, I went to the theater with them, and we're paying you know, for tickets at the front, and, and the black people are coming in the side door. What do you think my question is? What's up with you guys? Why aren't they coming in the front door? My oldest and biggest cousin... Bobby said, well, we don't allow that. What do you think my next question was? <laughs> Why not? Those are my friends in California. I didn't understand it. So injustices, I've seen them. I, I grew up watching that my whole life. Have we made progresses uh, along the way? Absolutely. We don't talk about that much as a nation. But we have tons of issues as a nation. I live to watch Woodstock happen, uh, the hedonistic thing. I, I live to watch universities taken over by, by socialistic, communistic, Marxist-type people. Um, I, I watched all that happen as I grew up. I read about it. I studied. I saw the demonstrations. But what does David say about all of that? What does he say? He brings comfort to those who might have no hope. What does he say? Verse 10. The Lord brings to counsel the nation of the nations to what? Nothing. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. It says he makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands how, how, how long? Forever. The plans of his heart, God's heart, it lasts to all generations. So here's the hope. No matter how twisted, messed up, subversive your culture becomes, the world becomes, no matter how scary it seems, David says, praise God because he always has a plan. Do you believe that? I do. It's the only way I make it from day to day when I watch what happens. You can't even pick a Supreme Court justice now, can you? Without it, uh, them getting Borked. Remember Bork? Justice Bork? Great, great man of God. I mean, I've read his, his books. I mean, a great thinker, very sensitive to divine things. But uh, we all know what happens to a justice. And you look at the world in which we live, and it's like you can't even pick somebody for a, a, a position of law and order in the country. Seems like it's all out of control, but what does David say? The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. Nothing. Trans, trans, 
<laughs> translated, they can't outbox God. Do you think God ever looks down at the cosmos, what nations are doing and political systems are doing and ideologies are doing? Do you think he ever looks down and goes, oh, that totally slipped my mind on that one? Does he ever look at the angels and go, I didn't have enough intel? I just, uh, I, I just finished uh, a gentleman with Crystal's book, a Team of Teams. Have you read that? You ha- how many have read that book? You know who McChrystal is? Yeah. Great book uh, about leadership. But the whole book is about, uh, it's about intel, how to get intel, and then how to process intel to teams to win, um, especially in a battlefield environment. Um, great book. Uh, but it's all about getting intel. Do you think God has to go gather intel? No. Omniscience means omniscience. He has total knowledge at all time, external things that go on, internal things that people are thinking. He knows all of that stuff. I mean, he's the ultimate intel machine. He knows everything. So when it says that he brings the the council of nations to nothing, means nothing that people within nations can do that's evil ever outfoxes his plan. What is God's plan, by the way? You should probably know. His plan is basically twofold. Redemptive, to save sinners from their sin, from Genesis 3.15 to to when Jesus appears in, in, in the Gospels, in John 1, he came to be the redeemer to die for our sins. He says so in Mark 10, 1045. I, the, he, he did not come to be served, to be, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for the many. So when you come to know him as, a, as the Savior, he just saved you. That, that's his mission. Do you think anything that the devil did in the Old Testament was going to stop God's plan of redemption? No. Boy, did he try. His other plan is uh, messianic, kingdom-oriented, that his kingdom's going to come. We pray about it when we do the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Next words. Thy kingdom come. Which kingdom? The messianic Davidic kingdom. Prophesied all throughout the Old Testament. I mean, I could take you on a tour to Isaiah 2, Isaiah 9, etc. Zechariah chapter 12, 13, 14, when the Messiah comes. Kingdom's coming. Are you ready for the king and the kingdom? So you think anything the devil is going to do through people that are, that are sinful in this world is going to stop the king from coming? No. Matthew chapter 25 says that at the end of time, Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus says that when he comes back at the end of the tribulation, the clouds part, the angels descend with him. It's an awesome moment. Because at that, at that point, what Daniel prophesied in Daniel 2, where the stone attacks the great image of world empires, he comes and destroys them and sets up his kingdom. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of God, his, his heart is for all generations. Nothing the devil will do will thwart that. Do you believe that? I do. You afraid of the Chinese military? No. No. Uh, Iran, what they might do? No. I mean, I've, I've listened to Al-Qaeda, ISIS bomb when I've been on the Bekaa Valley on tours before for two straight hours, bombing off in the distance while I got my tour group there. That's comforting. I'm glad I'm with the Israeli military at that point. We have a lawless, pernicious, law-hating people in our country. But God says, you're, you're not going to do anything that's going to overthrow my plans. My plans. Verse 10 says, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. The word no effect in Hebrew means to thwart. To thwart. I remember my first time at uh, Autopia in Disneyland as a little kid. I wanted to drive one of those cars. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know if they have it, if you've been there, but... I just lived to get in that car. So my sister Marla got in the car in front of me. I got in the car behind her. My goal is to ram her car with my little car. This is the way I was as a kid. And so I get in there, and I I just pedaled to the metal. I got this thing floored. And not only can I, I can't go off course, I can't go faster. I got that thing pegged. What was on the engine? A regulator. See, a regulator thwarted me from doing 120 when all the other little kids are going five. You know, I wanted to like zip around there. See, it, God says, when it comes to my kingdom program being uh, realized and my redemptive program, program uh, I, I'm going to thwart, I'm going to put a regulator on everything that's against me on the planet. If you're a king, if you're a politician, if you're a judge, if you're a university professor, whatever it is that you do that you think you're going to undermine people coming to, to be part of either knowing me or following me, I'm going to thwart that. I don't know about you, but I get great hope in that especially as I read the news from day to day. I just finished a book, another book by uh, John Piper, uh, and it's a small book. It's a short book. Uh, it's called Spectacular Sins and Their Global Purpose and the Glory of Christ. Spectacular Sins and Their Global Purpose and the Glory of Christ. Now, I know I've given you a lot of books to read over the years, and 
sometimes they're lengthy because you come and tell me, you know, that was like 700 pages, you know, okay, okay sorry. Okay, I'm going to tell you, this one's, this one's a smaller one. So if you're a student in school, this is for you. You can read this. I just finished it for devotions. It's a great book, uh, great read. What's the premise of the book? The premise of the book is this. God can take spectacular sins, I mean big sins, and flip them around and use them for his glory. Do you believe that? Oh, yeah. So when you read through this book, he, he goes through different sins that have been committed by humankind over thousands of years and shows how God took that sin and flipped that to do something amazing. Uh, I like uh, what happened at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. You know, all the people get together and, and they're building a tower so they can become like God. And they're, they're building a city so they don't have to depend on God. Genesis chapter 11, uh, verse 4 reads this. And they, the people, said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Let's get together as ultimate humanists. Build a ziggurat, a tower that has a, a walkway all the way around it that reaches to the heavens. And in their theological system, you, you had what was called the primordial realm where the spirits and the gods dwelt up, up in the heavens. So the higher you got, the greater the probability you could become like them. So this is man trying to become God. He's building a, a, a tower to the heights of the heavens. God just laughs at this. Because it says, ironically, that God saw what man was doing, and then he came down. <laughs> it's funny. They think they're all that, and God says, mm -mm, you ain't even close to where my throne is. I'm going to come down and see what you're doing. And then to thwart their activity in building this tower to deify themselves and make themselves dependent upon uh, just man and not God, God gave them a problem. What was the problem? Language. It's the reason why when you go to school, you've got to take German, French, whatever, right? It goes back to Babel. What does Babel mean? In Hebrew, Babel means to confuse. So God, oh, God's like, oh, you think you're going to outfox me? Mm, no. I'll just do something that's never been done in earth history before. You're all unified in your language. I'll just make it to where you're all speaking a plethora of languages, and then you can't communicate with each other. Imagine you're trying to lay bricks, and you are all speaking the same language, which I think was Hebrew, by the way. Um, just saying. And all of a sudden, you talk to the guy next to you to pass some order, and he's speaking Chinese. And then the next guy's speaking Russian. And then, you see what I mean? What happens to said building project if no one can communicate? There goes the ziggurat. God says, I'll just give you a problem. He judged them with languages, Babel, confusion. But notice when you get to the book of Revelation, the end of the Bible, chapter 5, verse 9, uh, tells you that when um, John gets transported into the presence of God, and is standing before the throne of God, and he sees a scroll uh, that, is, uh, that is there with seven seals on it, and this is a whole other sermon, but that, that's the title deed to the earth, and Jesus is going to reclaim it. He's the only one capable to snap the seals. And notice what is said there in chapter 5, verse 9. It says, and they, they sang a new song. What was the song? Well, the lyrics are, you are worthy, speaking of Jesus, to take the scroll and to open its seals, seven of them. You, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of what? Every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we will reign on the earth. Remember, the kingdom's coming, and nothing the devil can do can stop it. But who did Jesus redeem? People from every language group. What's the significance of this? God took a, a sinful action of mankind, a spectacular sin of Nimrod and his wife Semiramis, he took them and totally confused their, their situation with languages. And then at the end of time, we find out that God took all those languages, gave that, those languages his gospel, and saved people from all of those ethnicities. This is amazing. Because it would be one thing to save people who spoke only one language, much more difficult to save people with the gospel through multiple languages. God says, I'm going to take a judgment, and I'm going to flip it around and do something amazing with it. What did David say? The counsel of the Lord, he brings the counsel of the, of the nations to nothing. He thwarts them. Indeed, he does. Babel is an illustration. So is the cross of Christ. Do you think the devil knew that, that, that the Messiah was going to die? Think he knew that? I mean, have you read the Old Testament? See, the devil, devil is a whole other job security, basically. Um, the, the devil, if you study him, uh, the highest created being in the cosmos. 
very intelligent, the most beautiful being ever created. Uh, if you go back and read uh, the scriptures, uh, you know, Ezekiel chapter 28, etc. Um, so what does the devil do when uh, the Messiah shows up? Well, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, he tempts the Messiah three times and basically says to him, if you will but worship me, I'll give you all these things. What does Jesus do? He quotes scripture to rebuke the devil. See, the devil doesn't want Jesus to go to the cross. He tries to prohibit it from doing that. So when that tactic did not work, he reconnoitered and he got a hold of Peter and gave Peter an idea to rebuke Jesus. So when Jesus later in, in Matthew 16 tells the disciples he's going to die for the sins of mankind, our, our sin, Peter, being emotionally driven as he was and tends to be like the bull in the china shop, right, says to Jesus, verse 22 of Matthew 16, far be it from you, Lord, this, your death, shall never happen to you. I mean, this is in, from a military perspective. Peter just told Jesus, on my watch, you're not dying. What did Jesus do? Did he look at Peter and say, hey, thanks, Peter, for that encouragement. I totally appreciate that. What did he say? If you have a King James Bible, what did he say to him? Get thee behind me, who? Satan. Satan. Because Satan was inspiring Peter to say that. Because Jesus says, my, my face is set like flint to go to the cross. You, Satan, cannot stop me. So when the devil realized he couldn't stop Jesus that way, well, then what did he do? Well, he switched tactics. Later, it says in Luke chapter uh, uh, 2 and following, the uh, other places, he, he's going to eventually take Judas, one of the disciples, and enter into him at the, at, at the end of uh, Christ's life and inspire Judas to betray Christ, to send him to the cross. So the devil says, if I can't stop you, I'll send you to the cross, the most brutal kind of death, and I'll make sure it's brutal. But what did the devil not anticipate? He's not omniscient. What did he, he didn't put the dots together, did he? Because he had a major problem on day three. <laughs> did he not? I know it's not Easter. We're getting way ahead of ourselves. But um, I got to say something to preach about on Easter. But the third day, the Messiah rose. Now, what I like is what Paul writes about in Colossians chapter 2 about God turning this evil thing to a great thing. In Colossians 2 verse 13, notice what Paul says. And you, as a, when you were a non-Christian, you were what? You were dead in your trespasses and sins. He says, uh, he says, he, Jesus, has made alive together with him, having forgiven all you all your trespasses. So when a person realizes I'm a sinner and I need the Savior, and his program was come to earth to die for my sin and rise the third day to give me life and forgiveness, he forgives you of all your trespasses makes you his child. Having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, which none of us could fulfill all of the Torah, the law, he did, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Thank God he did that. Having disarmed who? Principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Uh, the word for principalities and powers uh, is uh, Greek was in language in the New Testament. Arkos is uh, principality. Power is exousias. These are code words for demonic powers. That's what they are. See, when God created the angelic beings, and this is a whole other sermon series. We'll do it sometime. Uh, angelology. You probably love that series. Nobody would. Okay, when we do it. But <laughs> when he created them, they have, they have rank. Just like a military has rank. They have rank. And so these are powers of ranks within the demonic forces. And what did Jesus do after he was resurrected and defeated the devil? He made a public display of them, triumphing over them in their dimensionality. What was he basically telling them? <laughs> you guys blew it. You guys lost. I defeated your plans. What did David say? The counsel of the wicked will be thwarted by God Almighty. See, that was the cross. Don't you know that was their ha-o -oh moment when the stone rolled away and he went through the grave clothes and came out physically resurrected? Absolutely. See, you cannot thwart what God's going to do. So I hope this sermon's giving you hope. If you walk away from here depressed, I don't know how to help you. You should be excited about our day and time no matter what's going on. Pray for great things to happen, but don't lose hope that God has his hand on the wheel. Revelation eleven fifteen. One of the seventh trumpet judgments, uh, toward the end of the tri seven-year tribulation, we read this. There's a collective shout, it, and they shout what? The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. 
See, the, the saints shout that when the king's finally coming, down goes all worthy early empires and all of their wickedness, and here comes the king of righteousness and peace. Who cannot be shouting about that? There won't be one Christian, I don't care how introverted you are, that will be standing there going, Man, that's kind of cool. <laughs> no, no, you won't. No, you're going to be shouting. And he says that a nation that lives like this, that understands that God has a plan, he says the nation that understands that, he says in verse 12, is blessed. Notice what he says. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. They are blessed when they understand who he is. And then he's going to tell you, in case you aren't connecting the dots, like why they're blessed. He's going to give you two reasons why they're blessed when they understand God's plan. Number one, he says in verse 13, the Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all of the sons of men from the place of his dwelling. He looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He made you and he gives you a free will. But then on the other side, what does he say? He considers all your works. He knows you. He knows why you do what you do, why you go where you go, how you, why you hang out, what you watch, what you think, what your motivations are. He knows all these things. See, Jesus uh, told us he is omniscient. God sees all things and knows all things. So on judgment day, when unbelievers and believers appear before God and we have our separate judgments, Jesus says in Matthew 10, this is most interesting. Here's what Jesus says, Matthew 10. He says, therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. You can fake me out, you can deceive me, you can, and people do it in politics and in, in military life all the time. But he says, you will, not, you will not fool me. On judgment day, I will take everything that you have hidden and I will showcase it for all the world to see. So when I judge you, you, you will know the judgment is just. So that when you miss heaven and don't inherit heaven, it's on you. For the believers... Uh, we know from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we will stand before God not to be judged for heaven or hell, but he will judge us based upon our performance and how well we ran after him, followed him. It says in 1 Corinthians 3, he will, he will throw your, li your life into his fire of judgment and he will want to see what is wood, what is hay, what is stubble, what is gold, what was done for the right reasons in following me. I mean, what was the quality, not the quantity, the quality of your work as you followed me. On that day, all things were we recovered. You know, Michael and I, we're both in our 60s, uh, and uh, we, we had a discussion the other day about, you know, what do you think about as you get older? And we both agreed, we both spend more time thinking now about giving account to God one day than anything, because we reverence God and know we have to give account to Him. Who wants to stand there and go, Lord, I need a little more time to get my act together? No, no, no. I mean, uh, a nation is blessed when the people understand that God is going to judge them. If you're a politician, how would, that, how would that change how you talk to reporters? If you're a reporter and you understand you're going to have to give account to God for how you report, how's it going to change your reporting? If you're, a, if you're a judge, how's it going to change how you're a judge? If you're a police officer, how's that going to change how you treat people? I mean, on and on goes the list, does it not? When you're a husband that takes business trips and you leave your wife and kids and you're off doing stuff with people from the office at hotels, it, ch it changes how you think about yourself. This is why he says you're blessed as a nation when the Lord is your God. Why? Because you know his eye is on you, so you learn how to live differently. And how is that? Morally, spiritually, and God blesses that nation. What's missing in our nation? Fear of God, reverence for God. When the nation reverences God, God blesses that nation. The second thing he says is uh, a nation is blessed of God when they understand that their military is not all that. And I'm pro-military. Don't take me wrong. But what does he say in verse 16? He says, no king is saved by the multitude of what? An army. A mighty man uh, is not delivered by his great strength. A horse, uh, that, I guess a mighty man is probably a special ops person, right? A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver you by any of its strength. He says a nation is blessed when they realize they might have a powerful military, but there's a power greater than their military. That's God, and they fear him, and they reverence him. You know, and to me, this is what makes America different than most nations. We have a great, powerful military, but we have a lot of godly people in the military who understand we have this power at our disposal, but there's a power greater than the military, and they reverence him. 
Uh, when I was a kid uh, in the 60s, uh, next to my house, we lived on the bad side of town because uh, my parents didn't have a lot of money. Uh, and I lived near a switchyard. Uh, and there's a railroad track by my house. And so uh, when I was a little kid, uh, we would walk down the railroad track, all my friends from the block, because uh, um, Patton had trained his tank corps for Africa Corps uh, uh, in the desert where I grew up. Uh, and so after World War II, they took the tanks and half tracks and they parked them by my house. It was awesome. <laughs> I kid you not. This is no stretch of the imagination. When we found out that there were Sherman tanks there and half tracks, guess where we went all the time? Down the tracks. And my grandpa worked down there for Southern Pacific. So we'd walk down the rail tracks, down to the switchyard, and we each had our own half track and tank. <laughs> now we'd be warmongers and we'd, we'd sent for counseling and whatever. We were just innocent kids having fun. But I, as a kid, saw the, the thickness of those tanks and thought, man, how would you ever defeat something like this? Well, there was tiger tanks that did, and, you know, I understood, but it's like, this is amazing. Later, when I got married, and Liz and I were at our first church in uh, the Tucson area, one of my friends uh, was the officer running, uh, you know, part of Davis Motham Air Base, and he took us on the base one day to give us a tour of everything. That's where they have the A-10s, the Warthogs. And they, they flew over my house all the time because their bombing range by my, where the church was. So three would fly over, you know, all the time. You could hear those loud engines. Well, Roger took us to the airfield uh, to show us everything. And I remember the day we went out in his, he's the, he's the head officer. He parked us on the, uh, out on the tarmac. And there are eight tens to infinity. And it's just me and Liz and Roger. And he's talking to Liz. And so I'm just kind of moseying on over to the eight tens. I see a red line on the ground. I'm from California. What's a red line for? We cross things like that. So I was about to step over said red line. Roger saved my life that day. He, stop! Like, what's up? Don't move! Like, why? See those guys in the Jeep down there? Yeah, those two guys? And yeah. He goes, you step over that. Well, they're going to come down here and, like, take you out. Okay, so I just ran over to the plane, touched it, ran back. Uh, uh, no, no, I didn't do that. No, I thought about that, but I'm a little smarter than that. I went back to Roger, and I just kind of stood there. Like, I'm, I'm glad you're here, you know. Uh, but I stood there, and I watched the power of the, of the American Air Force, the armament. He showed us a video of the weapon systems, what they could do. It's unbelievable. But as I'm sitting there looking at that video of what an A-10 can do, I thought to myself, but how great is God? He could defeat our enemies with one A-10. No tanks. He wouldn't need soldiers. See, it's, we, need, we, we need people who understand the importance of humility, not hubris, humility. That these are things God has blessed us with, but there's a God behind these things who's far greater, far greater. May we have a nation that understands God has a plan and our military is not going to make the plan happen. We need a God behind the military who, who does his great work. Last thing he says in verses 18 to 22 is most interesting. He says, we don't only praise, the other last reason why we praise God is not just for the plan he gives us, that he's coming. But we, we need to praise him because he's a God in the present who gives us provision. He provides for us. And this, I could speak to you about this all day, the provision of God for my life. Verses 18 and following, behold, the eye of the Lord is on who? Those who fear him. Does God really have eyes? It's another sermon series. Anthropomorphic language. It's just telling you he sees you. He sees you. Remember Jesus said, if he has his eye on a little sparrow, how much more important are you than a little bird? He says his eyes on you, and he, his eyes on those who hope in his what? Mercy. Hebrew word chesed. Lo, it means the loyal love of God. Would you as a father ever see a child in a desperate situation and not do all you could in your power to come help them? That's chesed. He says, he keeps his eye on those who understand chesed. He delivers their soul from death. He keeps them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. Who is he? He is our help and shield, not our army. He is our help and shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, your chesed, your loyal love, O Lord, Yahweh, the eternal one, be upon us just as we hope in you. What's, what's he saying? Don't ever forget that the great God who created all things that wants you to praise him, who, who has a plan he's working out, never forget that on a daily basis, he's in your life to bring provision, no matter what happens. No matter what happens. Uh, last year, as, as, as our lives grew complex with what to do with Liz's mom as she was 
dying, what to do with a dementia, Alzheimer's stepfather. What do we do with them? They're running out of money. We didn't know what to do. And months and months of complexities and sleepless nights. At one phone call, we were connected by accident to one social worker who, who helped us navigate those deep waters. See, what, what was that? It was provision of God. His eyes on you. Does that mean you're not going to ever have difficulty? No. No. But God's provision is always there. He's like, hey, you need to meet this person. I'll make sure your paths cross. See, this is the way God works. When, uh, when uh, Elijah fled uh, from Jezebel after the, uh, defeating the prophets of Baal on, on Mount Carmel, uh, he's heading south, you know, some hundred miles to Sinai fleeing from her and along the way uh, God sent an angel to feed him provision so you have to stop and say God I praise you because I haven't given you enough praise for the times you fed my soul you provided for me you provided he shows up and he gives you what you need at the right moment and when he gives you that thing which causes your jaw to drop what should you do praise him praise him our first president was a man who understood God uh, George Washington, oh, for more leaders that talk like this. Here's what he said at his first inaugural address, and realize how much he says about knowing God and walking with God, because he's really praising God in his inaugural address. Here's what he says. He says, it would be procurely improper to omit it in this first official act, my fervent supplications to that almighty being who rules the universe who presides in the council of the nations and whose providential aids can supply every human defect, that his benediction may consecrate to the liberties and the happiness of the people of the United States a government instituted by themselves for these essential purposes and may, and may enable every instrument employed in its administration to execute with success the functions allotted to his charge. Intending this homage to the great author of every public and private good. Uh, see, he sees God as, as he's in all things. I assure myself uh, that it expresses your sentiments not less than my own, nor are these of my fellow citizens at large less than either. No people can be bound to uh, acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they've advanced to the character of the independent nation seems to have been distinguished by the same token of providential agency. What did he just say in English? I, as the leader, understand that behind all the great things we've done as a nation and our founding as a nation, all hinges on God Almighty being behind us and blessing us. He was praising God. Those are the kind of people... We need to continue to be. Those are the kind of people we need to pray for. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the clarity of Scripture. Uh, may our lives align with what David has said. May we praise you for all stated reasons here. Forgive us when we've been way too quiet and have not have given you the great adoration and praise worthy of your dear name when you provide for us. Thank you that you are the God who has a plan, and if we are in despair, feel hopeless, whatever those feelings are, those are not of you, those are from the devil. We rebuke those, and we say, in their place, place, place great hope in what lies ahead, for the king is coming. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.